What consequences would astronomy face if James Webb had failed? Does SETI still do good work? Does our universe live inside a giant black hole? And in the free version of Q&A Plus on Patreon, can there be an experiment that would provide proof of alien life? Answering all these questions and more in this question show. It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are across my channel, the question pops in your brain, just write it down, I'll gather them up, and I will answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Vince Baker, are black hole jets the result of things falling in? Sort of. Um, so yeah, we see these pictures of black holes. And I'm sure at this point, if you're watching this, there's going to be a really cool animation of a black hole with a accretion disk around it and these jets that are going out of the poles of the black hole. And people say, well, if stuff can fall into a black hole and nothing can escape, not even light, then how can you have this material blasting away from black holes? Well, they're not coming from the black hole. They're coming from the region around the black hole where you can escape. And so what happens is that material that is trying to fall into the black hole, sometimes it can be too much. The black hole can't handle it. Sort of think about like a drain in your bathtub, right? You pull the plug out of your bathtub and the water goes around. It can't all fit down the pipe yet. And so it has to spin and wait until room is made. And so the same thing is happening with a black hole, all this material has to fall into the black hole, there's not enough room to go into the event horizon. And so this material has to pile up into this accretion disk and wait. And so as you get this black hole is rotating in this in the center of this giant accretion disk, you get these very powerful magnetic fields that form around the black hole. And then these create funnels that channel material away from the poles of the black hole. And you get the same kind of situation with, you know, at the largest scales with supermassive black holes, but even at small scales where you have individual new stars forming. Uh, they have, you know, they're not a black hole, but they still can create these jets, these outflows that go out from the poles. So it's not coming from the black hole, it's being fed by the accretion disk in the environment around the black hole. J.R. Corday, lately, there's been a lot of talk in papers proposing that our universe might be inside a black hole. How are these studies proposing we get an entire universe's worth of mass from one black hole? Now, there have been people proposing that the universe is inside a black hole for a long time. And, you know, one sort of interesting coincidence is that if you take all of the mass of the observable universe, it is roughly the same as a black hole with an event horizon the size of the observable universe. That's interesting, probably a coincidence. But the talk recently about this, comes actually from one paper. So not a whole bunch of papers, but one paper, uh, one interesting finding. And that is that images from the James Webb Space Telescope seen out to the very edge, the farthest galaxies that Webb is able to see, most of the galaxies appear to be rotating in the same direction. And this is very surprising because around us more locally, we see galaxies rotating in completely random directions, which is what you would expect, right? You would expect it just to be chaotic and that there would be no direction that everything was spinning. And so one theory that the researchers who found this rotation said, well, maybe the whole universe is inside a black hole and this black hole is turning. And that would explain why you've got, you know, whatever the direction is that the black hole is turning, that is also causing the direction of the galaxies that are spinning at the very edge of the observable universe. But there's also a very plausible other explanation. And that is that we live in a galaxy that is turning in one direction. And that you know, based because of our motion in the galaxy, that's going to change the the way we see these galaxies at the very limits of what James Webb can observe. And that if we had a better telescope, we would be able to see other galaxies that are turning in in that same area that are in random directions. So it's, you know, like, which is it? Is it more likely that we're in a black hole that is turning or that we're part of the Milky Way, and it's just an observational error. So I would not be surprised if that result goes away. Uh, you know, it's cool, but you know, less likely than some issue with the way we're observing them. 
L. Bartles 87. If Webb had failed, how would that have affected the next observatory to be built? Would they try James Webb again or choose another infrared telescope or would they still focus on habitable worlds? Oh, I can't even imagine what would have happened if James Webb had failed. It would have sucked. What would they have done? So no, they wouldn't have built another one. It was a one off. So uh, if the rocket had failed, Webb had been destroyed. There's too many other missions in the pipeline, they would have just kept going. And you've seen examples of missions in the past that would have been very interesting if they had launched and had been successful. But then for whatever reason, there was a problem and they just move on. I mean, there were missions to Mars, there was missions to the moon, and they failed. There, there's been solar sail missions that have failed. And they just keep moving, keep moving on. There's other missions in the pipeline. Nobody's got enough money to stop everything and build another James Webb from scratch. So they would just adapt. You know, when you look at, say, the loss of Kepler, Kepler should have been operational for a lot longer. It should have found targets for James Webb to explore, but it died early, or at least it lost its reaction wheels and it wasn't able to continue on its main mission and had to adapt. Well, now Webb is studying the red dwarf world that Kepler was able to find. And so you get this, this adaptation. If Kepler had survived, we would probably be living in a different timeline where Webb is examining the kinds of worlds that you know, the Earth sized worlds orbiting sun like stars. That's what Webb would be attempting to help observe and then things would be moving. And so like whatever is the next priority for the scientific community is the thing that they would be building. They would want something like the Havel Worlds Observatory. But there would like there'd be a giant gap, like it would just be awful. This missing chunk in our ability to observe the distant universe. Owen Bowen, will Vera Rubin be able to detect warp signatures? Vera Rubin wouldn't be able to do it. Uh, because it is a you know, visible light telescope, but LIGO might be able to detect warp signatures or specifically, it might be able to detect the gravitational waves that come from a warp bubble collapsing. There's just like a science paper that says that that if a warp drive was going and if it collapsed and destroyed catastrophically the spacecraft, then that would send out gravitational wave ripples that in theory we could detect. So no, if we want to detect warp drives, we need our gravitational wave observatories. But it's kind of a crazy thing to think about that with a sensitive enough gravitational wave observatory, we could detect the gravitational waves of spacecraft zipping around the universe. It's time for a shout out on our new patrons at the $5 level and above. Read on the road, Tony Hennessy, JR, Reverend Lowell K. Smith, David McKinnon, Tim Thorpe, Dan Theus, Roy Larson, Adam Stark, and Larry Bliss. Join the community at patreon.com slash universe today. Ian add, how will we manage time on the moon or Mars? Is there a plan? GPS depends on time, humans expect sleep periods, etc. So the moon and Mars are two different situations. We'll sort of deal with them one at a time. So with the moon, uh, a day on the moon is two weeks long. So you've got 14 days of sunlight and then 14 days of darkness. And so how are they going to deal with that? I mean, they're going to have to just deal with a sleep schedule. I don't know, like the way they deal with it on a submarine. Like I'm sure people who are on a submarine, they have schedules they are under the sea. They don't really, you know, they don't see sunlight. They just follow a clock and that's the time they get up and that's the time they go to bed or when you're in Antarctica and it is 24 hours of night, right? Day after day after day, uh, you just follow a schedule. And so I'm sure with with the moon, that's what they're going to do. Now, the other issue with the moon is that down on the surface of the moon, you're in a different gravity well than you are when you're on the surface of the Earth. And so the greater the mass, the slower your clocks run. And so on the surface of the Earth, our clocks will run slower than the people who are on the moon. And so if you have a GPS system that is orbiting around the Earth, but the people are trying to use that to navigate on the moon, it's not going to remain accurate because the you're going to have different amounts of, of time dilation, which is crazy. And so people have actually taken this into account. There's a, there's whole groups right now thinking about how to resolve this problem that there will probably be a constellation of satellites that are orbiting around the moon that are 
operating on lunar time where they're sending signals down to the surface of the moon and the GPS systems are accounting for the right amount of time dilation because you're on the surface of the moon. You know, what time is it on the moon? You know, the moon doesn't correspond to a time zone on Earth. And so you're going to have to have, um, you know, it's going to have to be a time for the moon and that the clock is going to run more quickly than it does on the Earth. Mars is a different creature. So with Mars, um, a day on Mars is like 24 hours and 50 minutes, I forget the exact number, but is it's just shy of 25 hours. And so yeah, you could probably do you know, a couple of days of that. But after a while, it's going to start to build up. And in fact, uh, you know, when NASA originally runs missions on Mars, they will try and follow a schedule that is similar to the Martian day so they can do all the science that they want to do. But eventually they have to go back to shifts. Um, and so I don't know what people are going to do on Mars because that like the human body we evolved in a 24 hour day. It'll be very weird to constantly be experiencing a 25 hour day. Can we adapt our circadian rhythm to a, to a 25 hour day? I don't know. Uh, we'll find out. And then same thing, which is that, you know, the clocks will run at a different speed than they do on Earth and they do on the moon. So there'll have to be a GPS system that's orbiting around Mars that is providing that information and it is adapting for the time dilation that they will experience based on the, the movements of the satellites and the gravity well that people are on the surface of Mars. But but yeah, these are the kinds of challenges, the details that will have to be figured out for us to try and create some kind of long term sustainable life in space. Walter Hartman does SETI still do good work. SETI is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And for the longest time, SETI was had a really hard time doing any work at all. So back in the 1960s or so when SETI was first proposed, it was like Project Ozma, where Frank Drake was proposing that they would point radio telescopes at stars and listen for some kind of signal of um, an advanced civilization. And then you got this giggle factor that came in through the 1970s, 80s and 90s, where there was no funding for SETI. And so any researcher, any SETI researcher had to find private funding. Uh, fortunately, there were wealthy donors that were fascinated by the idea about searching for aliens. And so you had the SETI Institute that was doing good work, and they actually had access to their own radio telescope. But it you know, wasn't very much compared to the giant radio telescopes that were out there like Arecibo and the fast telescope in China. And then about in the early 2000s or so late 1990s, early 2000s, scientists started to find extreme forms of life here on Earth. Uh, they found life that could handle 130 degrees Celsius in these hot pools in Yellowstone. They found life at the bottom of the ice under glaciers in Antarctica, they found life huddled up inside nuclear reactors, life that could handle salt, acidity, alkalinity. And they realized that those conditions that we know of out there across the solar system, what's on Mars, what's in Europa and Enceladus, that life from Earth could handle those kinds of environments. And so now you had this renaissance in searching for life and suddenly it wasn't silly it wasn't you didn't giggle, you were serious looking for life on Mars looking for life on Europa thinking about those kinds of things. And then it very naturally became well, if we're going to search for life for for dumb life, why not search for smart life also. Um, and so about 10 years ago, NASA started to take this question a lot more seriously, and started to provide some level of funding and the SETI Institute has been doing great work all this time. Um, and they were able to uh, very recently, do a, some really interesting deals with large radio telescope facilities. Essentially, they get a copy of all of the radio observations that these telescopes are making. So while they're observing pulsars, while they're scanning planets, also a chunk of this data are being 
gathered up by the SETI researchers, and then they're able to study it. They've been able to get access to the precursor telescope for the square kilometer array. Um, and so you're seeing a lot of really interesting papers coming out of the SETI Institute. So I would say actually, the SETI Institute, just like SETI researchers in general, both in the US as well as you know, researchers in China, around the world are doing some of the best work ever in SETI. So it really is a golden age of SETI right now. It's no longer considered ridiculous to search for aliens. It's like a natural scientific question that has a scientific answer. And now people are very motivated to find out the answer. And I think, you know, it's a good time to become a SETI researcher. Did you know that you can watch the same video with no ads and get a bonus question over on Patreon completely for free? We call it Q&A Plus. This week's bonus question is all about searching for a definitive proof of extraterrestrial life. And I'll put a link in the show notes so you can watch that video. All right, those are all the questions that we had this week. Thank you, everyone. Uh, everyone who put your questions into the YouTube comments, as well as everybody who joined us for the live show. Now, we record the show live Monday at 5 p.m. somewhere in the world. Um, but there's going to be a link to the next episode here on the channel, so you can check that out. Now, I'm going to give you an update on how things are going with Universe Today, the business. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew Gross, Bray Lake Roofing, Brian Bodie, Cared One, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Bailock, Cy Nelson, David Gilton and David Matz, Dustin Cable, Evan Pro, Greg Feely, Hans Schultz, Hudson Ward, Jade Graves, James Clark, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Marcel Smith, Michael Purcell, Modso, Paul Robach, Ren Kaidu, Robeck, Sean Sargent, Stanislav Zarajev, Stephen Fowler Munley, Thomas L. Skadron, Vlad Shiplin, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. So it's been about a month, a little less than a month, since I gave you my big update about the complete and total collapse of my business model. And uh, and many of you have responded, and we've gotten a ton of new patrons, and people have been asking me, how is it going? What's, you know, what's the update? And the reality is we close the gap. We are able to now fully fund the operations of Universe Today completely through the assistance of the patrons. We have a little bit of revenue that comes through ads on here on YouTube because we can't turn them off. And if we turn them off, then they'll just claim the revenue. Um, and on that note, YouTube has sent me a very helpful email saying that they would be glad to take over responsibility for handling mid-roll ads if we want. Uh, we've told them that we don't, and we're just going to keep them turned off. But you know, that is inevitable. Um, but yeah, apart from that, you know, I've been very, very busy. I'm, I'm meeting with 12 people a day as I'm, I'm sort of processing all of the new patrons and anyone who wants to do an interview with me can. Um, and uh, it's been just incredible. And like, I still haven't completely unwound that, you know, some part of my brain worries about search engine optimization, YouTube algorithm, staying on the good side of advertisers, finding sponsors, um, uh, AI slop, all of this stuff that you know I've spent decades having to think about and having to worry about. And now I don't have to think about any of that. I literally get up, think about interesting stories that I'm curious about, task a bunch of writers, do my part on the site, and make videos. And that's it. And I can completely explore my own curiosity. I'm not concerned about what the wider world thinks about what that we're doing with the universe today. So it is amazing. And it's all thanks to you. So again, thank you. And enjoy uh, all of the benefits, which is that we're just producing tons of content. There's no ads everywhere we can think of it. And uh, we should be around forever until the heat death of the universe. All right, we'll see you next time.